Hello, my name is Alex Segerman. Uh, welcome to the webinar, uh, Cairo Modern, a discussion with Dr. Muhammad Shahid. Uh, I am professor of Islamic art history at Rutgers Newark, and we're coming to you live here from Intro to Islamic Architecture uh, with some Rutgers Newark students. So doing a sort of new version of, um, of this webinar, but we're delighted to have Dr. Al Shahid here with us today. He was supposed to give a talk in March of 2020, so that got canceled and we're really delighted to have him back. Um, Dr. Mohammed Shahid is curator and architectural, a curator and architectural historian focusing on modernism in Egypt and the Arab world. He is author of a fantastic book named Cairo Since 1900, an Architectural Guide, published by AUC Press in 2020, which is the first comprehensive survey of the city's modern architecture, including 226 buildings in 17 geographic areas built from 1900 to the present. He uh, graduated from NJIT, just right across the street from us here at Rutgers Newark and then earned a master's from the Aga Khan program at MIT and a PhD from NYU's Department of Middle Eastern Studies. His work spans architecture, design, and material culture. And in 2011, he founded the fantastic CairoObserver.com, uh, which started out with six printed issues of a magazine distributed for free in events in Cairo, Beirut, and Dubai, aiming to stimulate public debate around issues of architecture, heritage, and urbanism in the region. And he's currently continuing the work of Cairo Observer with a fantastic Instagram account, um, Cairo Observer. I encourage everyone to follow it. Um, today, he's going to be speaking to us specifically about his new exhibit, Cairo Modern, which is at the Center for Architecture in New York City. Um, some of the students and I visited over the weekend, and it's fantastic. And it's up until January 22nd. So if you're in the region, please Take, a, uh, take the opportunity to go and check it out. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. El Shahid. And, um, and then after um, he finishes speaking, we're gonna have some questions from the audience. But if you have questions um, for him, please put those in the Q&A and I will have some of our students pose those questions to him after, after that. And we should be wrapping up around 11 o'clock. So thank you and take it away. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that everyone can see. Um, so thanks so much, Alex. Alex and I have known each other for years. We've both been fellows at the American Research Center in, um, in Egypt um, in the past 10 years um, when, you know, being a researcher in Egypt was not necessarily the most, uh, the easiest thing in the world. Um, just trying to make this full screen really quick. Um, da, da, da. There you go. All right. Um, so thank you, Alex, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to speak to uh, this group uh, about Cairo Modern, an exhibition that just opened last month, October 1st, uh, at the Center for Architecture in New York. Um, what I'll do is maybe um, I'll give an overview of the exhibition, even though your group has seen it, uh, but just so that we're all on the same page, I'll give it an overview of the exhibition um, with some of the main ideas, its organization, um, some of the figures, stories that are mentioned or uh, are told within the exhibition space, um, and how it links to, I guess, what I'm working on at large. And then uh, maybe this will take about 30, 35 minutes, and then we can um, I'm very eager to, to engage with, with the group um, uh, and their questions and discussion uh, on the exhibition and larger issues. So thank you for that. Um, the exhibition Cairo Modern um, was set to open last March um, at the Center for Architecture in their downstairs space, actually. Um, so a silver lining of the uh, delay because of the pandemic um, is that now it's on the street level space, it's in the street level space, which is fantastic. Um, it is accompanying the book, as Alex mentioned, um, and the book came out in March uh, 2020. 
Um, it is basically, uh, it's important for me to, to say two things. One, it's the first of its kind of its in that particular format, um, uh, in the sense that it, it, it includes projects that span the entire uh, geography of the city. Of course, that is a condition statement. <laughs> it's impossible to really include the entire geography of any city into a single architectural guidebook, but at least um, it moves away from the geographic parameters that have been the constraints of previous studies, which usually looked at uh, what we call downtown and uh, a few other areas that were populated with buildings uh, from the mid 19th century to the early 20th century. That's typically what's gotten uh, attention um, sort of before, I, I suppose, my generation of scholars, more and more people have been working on the legacy of 20th century architecture in various locations of the global south. Um, Egypt was the natural um, spot for me to go back to, um, and we can talk about that um, later as well. Why, why, uh, why Cairo, why Egypt, um, and so on. So the exhibition, um, if you've been to the space before, if you're familiar with it, uh, it's uh, the main space and the atrium and the small side gallery. It's organized, uh, just an overview in case people haven't been to the exhibit um, of the organization of the space. And I just want to say that um, organizationally, everything is kind of um, put into three, let's say, tiers, if you think of it as like a, a three layers of a, of a cake of some sort. At the bottom um, uh, strip uh, are 20 uh, examples of buildings that were um, half of which more or less have been demolished. Uh, those are buildings selected from the 1930s to the 1970s, which was actually the period that I focused on for my PhD uh, dissertation. Uh, it was the 30s to the 70s, um, but in order to later on sort of put that period in context, it was very important to go back uh, some decades before that and some decades after that. The book itself, Cairo since 1900, comes all the way to the present with some projects that are actually still in progress until now, uh, already included in the book. Um, so, uh, so the bottom tier of the exhibition space has the 20 examples that are selected from, um, from the 216 buildings that are in, or sites that are in the book. Uh, the middle slice, let's call it, is a kind of an informational layer. This is where you uh, um, find information about, um, let's say architects' biographies. So you can learn about a few of the architects uh, and their stories. Excuse me. Um, you can learn about thematics such as Cairo during World War II, the modern house, uh, the apartment block, um, these kind of uh, standard themes or lenses through which we can uh, visit this material. Um, and you also get to learn about certain geographic areas. It's a vast city. Uh, my assumption, uh, I'm very aware that this is um, primarily going obviously to be visited by an audience in the exhibition. Everybody knows various districts of um, of Cairo are, so it was important to uh, also include that uh, in that informational layer. Uh, the top layer is kind of uh, more or less uh, a kind of a discursive um, uh, I William Curtis uh, because. Uh, not only because the textbook that I studied she did, but it's also that textbook that has been in education since 1982, uh, with millions of copies all around the world, translated in many, many, many languages. So if we are, if we are going to tackle the architectural survey um, as it stands today, might as well start with one that's widely read uh, globally, uh, which is still extremely Eurocentric and um, it clearly has uh, very particularly um, uh, views that are very informed by a very particular perspective, um, but that's still pretty much the most common textbook. So William Curtis, uh, you'll see quotes by him up there, but also by Saeed Karim, who is a basically uh, a, a main figure, let's say, in the story of modernism that I'm trying to tell um, through the experience of what happened in a place like Cairo. So Sikim and also uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, who was visited uh, Cairo in 1957, uh, just before he died, and didn't have very nice things to say about the work of Egyptian architects that he saw. So in a way, that player, uh, that discursive space uh, is 
linking some of the various uh, threads of narrative that you see throughout the exhibition and other areas as well. Um, so that's more or less organizationally. And then there are also these two side stories uh, that are essentially Egyptian American exchanges, uh, two examples. Um, and they're in the little side, ga side gallery. One is, uh, again, like I mentioned, Frank Lloyd Wright visiting Cairo in 1957. And so you have a little bit of how at least the story was published within uh, the Egyptian architectural press um, and what Frank Lloyd Wright had to say about Egyptian modernism or what's being practiced in Cairo at the time. And the other story is um, from 1939 when Egypt had proposed um, a pretty lavish uh, pavilion to represent the country at that World's Fair in New York, um, the outbreak of World War I and given that Egypt was still under British colonial control, particularly militarily and economically, any projects such as this uh, were canceled um, as the country went into a war economy. Uh, and so the pavilion was never realized, but we at least get to, um, to, to learn about it uh, again through material that's been published and um, descriptions and so on. And this artwork, this tiny fragment of the artwork that was um, intended to line the entire, um, the to line the entire the whole interior of the pavilion um we only have two fragments that were published um i'm sure with additional research we can hopefully maybe find more details of what that artwork uh, should have looked like but what you're seeing here is um uh, a full one-to-one -one scale reproduction of that fragment that we have uh, which is actually how it was intended to be so that uh, androgynous figure pulling the um the tiger the the bottom uh, that's kind of the scale figure that's meant to be, um, yeah, full size. Um, so we're seeing it for the first time printed in New York um, at the scale it was intended to be. So these are the two side stories. Um, and I think, oh, the other element, I suppose, that I should point out um, is the timeline. Um, are you seeing this full screen or are you also seeing all the noise, all the little windows that are open? If someone can just... Alex? We're also seeing the windows. You're seeing the windows. Ah, oh, I see. Yeah. Are you ready for that? Maybe if I do this. Oh, there you go. All right. So then the third element I would say that uh, is worth note pointing out is the timeline. It was very important for me uh, to position these 20 specimens of the lens that were or sites that were selected for the exhibition in a sort of, um, yeah, in a sort of timeline, but uh, as an exercise, it would turn into something that, you know, when I started out with this timeline, I didn't have a, actually, I thought it would look very different, but um, but luckily working with the graphic designer, Ahmed Hamoud, who also designed the book, um, you know, bringing these, <laughs> bringing the two of us together came up, I guess, with what you see in front of you. I don't think this would have been possible without a talented uh, designer to sort of translate uh, all this information into a, a wall, a single wall. And the idea was to really try to position not only the buildings, but then other benchmarks or moments within the history of modern architecture or artificial practice in 20th century Egypt in general uh, in, in that timeline. And then to put all of that in context, uh, let's say within, um, in reference to uh, maybe more famous iconic uh, benchmarks in the history of modern architecture, 20th century architecture. Um, and that necess necess necessitated for me that I also add a layer of political and cultural events uh, around the world um, that uh, sort of impact uh, the development of architecture and directly or, or, or indirectly. So it ended up being this, multi-layered, um, it's, it's an exercise and it's something that I hope that um, like many other aspects of the exhibit, which is pretty simple in its form, I think, um, but I think it's really all in the content. Um, um, I think um, it was really important to really be able to see a snapshot of the 20th century on one wall where these new buildings are not being discussed out of context, but particularly in context of political, uh, and cultural benchmarks around the world that really shaped uh, the big picture. So it ended up being, like I said, this sort of four category timeline, Egypt architecture, uh, world architecture history, Egypt history world. 
Um, I'm very excited about this and I'm looking forward to hear what you think about it and, and to see how this can develop further. Essentially, it's an argument against the linearity of uh, art and architectural history that's been sort of the inherited viewpoint of how we can discuss and review history uh, from the Enlightenment onwards, this kind of, um, if I may say, failed um, project that we're all sort of still bur burdened with. Um, so an argument against that is to actually, um, well, to highlight that uh, history is not linear, that there are multiple, um, <laughs> very, very complex and multiple ways, networked overlapping ways in which a history um, uh, can be read. So anyway, it's one of the many propagations that I try to include within the span of the exhibit. Um, so now that I've gone through briefly the sort of components, um, just in case there are some who haven't been able to visit, I'll quickly run through the 20 examples of buildings that are shown in the exhibit. Um, a couple of things to highlight here are sources, and that's something that I think we should be talking about more in the discussion. I'll just flag some of these issues. If you notice, a lot of the images used in the exhibition come from um, printed sources, published sources, Alaymara magazine in particular. Um, and this is why there is an entire wall dedicated to Alaymara, because it's very significant to this particular research, but also um, it allows me to, um, to open up to the audience about sources, about the importance of magazines in this particular uh, context. Um, and also about the fact that if well, if we're relying on magazines, magazines publish, you know, a, a drop in the bucket of what's going on. Just think about right now. Um, do you think, you know, even in New York, where you have a plethora of publications around architecture and design, do you think simply picking up a magazine from the newsstand gives you a clear and complete picture of what's going on? Of course not. So if this is all we have, then I'm afraid it instead of being excited only about the information that we're finding in these kinds of sources, I'm also very much alarmed that um, this is, it's an awareness that the, the kind of information and buildings that are published are a drop in the bucket. So if we have this much, then we, we've we lost quite a lot. Um, and when I say lost, um, I talk both in the sense of the physical presence of the buildings. A lot of them have been demolished, which was one of the main points that I'm driving through the book, but also the exhibition. Um, and this is not a sort of, and, and I'm, I'm again going to flag um, topics that we can hopefully discuss at, at more length in the discussion, but the issue of preservation is one that we should talk about, um, because my stance on it is, is not um, preservationist impulse, as we've seen in post-war to Europe, let's say. It's a very different <laughs> drive um, or um, relationship to the notion of preservation. I'm more, much more interested in the preservation of information and history and um, and to be able to have a population of a city uh, first uh, aware of its own built environment, the history of its built environment, especially if it's a city that's undergoing quite a lot of rapid transformation under colonial, post-colonial, whatever you like to call it, forces that are essentially uh, reshaping the urban landscape. So a lot of these buildings are gone. A lot of their histories are gone. Um, the ones that are included in the book and, and, and exhibition are the ones that are, let's say, lucky enough that we have a little bit of information about. At least we have a photograph. We have some description uh, by the architects in some cases uh, as published. Um, but at, at any rate, it was important for me to start also with the 1930s, not only because this was the period that I started with for my PhD research, but uh, I think the 1930s are, for the history of modern architecture, are quite uh, significant and emblematic. This is also the decade, 1933 is when Saeed Karim, who's very, very visible in the exhibition and, and, and book, um, that's when he arrives in, uh, in Zurich to, to, to pursue a master's at ETH Zurich. Um, Hitler had just risen to power next door. <laughs> and so it wasn't a very friendly space to be um, an Egyptian architecture student. Um, and so you can imagine the kinds of things that he would have had to face. One example that I was able to pull out from the archive at ETH was the fact that he had to take multiple classes paid um, without credit simply to prove that as an Egyptian he's capable of completing an architecture degree at ETH Zurich. Um, I can leave it at that, but I just want to put that in context because I think 
the inherited, there's a kind of a discrepancy in our inherited image of the development of modern architecture that is completely divorced from political realities and the 1930s, uh, on, you know, you can, you can learn about the 1930s from the political lens and learn about the, you know, the rise of fascism and the events that um, ultimately led to World War II, but you can also, from a history book, uh, of architecture, get a very uh, aesthetically pleasing representation of the 1930s with villas and modernist houses and, and so on, um, mostly by European architects, some of whom had relationships with these problematic political regimes and so on. So I think the 1930s are, have this kind of um, bipolar, uh, I think, perception in, in, in sort of understanding in public perception. Um, so it was important to also position modernist architecture, the Egyptian context, um, from that period. I'm saying this to say that there is obviously, my argument is that uh, it didn't start in the 1930s. It simply happens to be um, a useful starting point. But um, one of the things that I find, uh, or that I found um, since I started really working on this topic um, is a lot of the conventions that were taught, for example, uh, about the development of modern architecture and thinking uh, is a particular relationship to tradition, which is completely absent in this context. So what does modernity mean for these uh, architects and their clients? Um, well, it's very, it's very great. It's very difficult to pin it down. And, um, uh, but it certainly isn't based on a notion of rejection of tradition or what preceded what's being referred to as the modern, which is actually another interesting point that I hope we uh, discuss a bit further, which is the significance of the word modern, modernness and modernism, um, none of which were really part of the discourse of these uh, architects. I don't think many people outside particular geographies were concerned with how, uh, what, you know, uh, with how, what, how to call things. Um, so um, the word modern and modernist uh, as stylistic, let's say tools um, uh, to sell a product, which is the modern house or, or you know, a particular aesthetic. Uh, none of those were really uh, mobilized in this particular way in this context. So I think these are things that are important to notice um, and to tease out from the stories of the various buildings. There are other aspects that, I, I mean, there's really an endless array of potential lenses through which to read any urban landscape. Um, but this one offers, I think, and I'm not saying it's unique, but I think because we have some published sources, because we have voices, because we have photographs, um, because of its geographic location, because of when we're talking, what was going on in Egypt, colonialism, uh, and other uh, forces um, that we have seen in hindsight unfold in particular ways. Um, this is Sayyid Karim that I've mentioned. Um, just to stop here at Sayyid Karim and pause, uh, the reason I mention all of this uh, because Sayyid Karim is, is a figure that I think had this been uh, an even playing field, uh, he would have been someone in our sort of global in English language uh, understanding of the history of modernism. Uh, but it is not an even playing field. It never is. It still isn't today. Um, and someone like him was very ambitious, driven by politics of independence um, and so on, ends up uh, being put under house arrest. His career ends in 1965. Um, this is not the first time this sort of thing has happened in Egypt. I had just recently mentioned on, on one of the Instagram posts, uh, Max Herz Pasha. This was the um, Jewish Austro-Hungarian architect who, since 1881, was basically in charge of the documentation preservation um, and listing of um, the ancient, uh, modern, um, I'm sorry, ancient um, Arab, Islamic, these categories are very loose. Um, so we can talk about that as well. Uh, architecture, and in 1914, he was kicked out by the British uh, when the Austro-Hungarian Empire started, uh, entered the war. So we've seen already before Sayyid Karim, uh, incident, many incidents actually, but we've yet to really be able to enumerate all of them uh, in which uh, colonial, and then hand it over to national political powers. Um, you know, I have a big question mark about what, what was the nature of this transition from um, a colonial, Egypt as a colonial state transfer, transforming into a, a nationalist uh, state. I think we have enough hindsight and clues to be able to, 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 to not take this as face value. I remember when I was a student, a lot of the, the works that we, uh, that I had access to that I was starting to see were about 
uh, a full sort of belief in the post-colonial project as if it was, but you know, we know a little bit more that necessarily wasn't, at least in the Egyptian context. In any case, politics does intervene not only in the shape and form of architecture, but also in the very much, uh, very much in the lives of people who produce uh, built forms, such as Saikarim, Mepsaris Pasha before that. So I try to highlight these stories and bring them to the foreground. Um, so not only did he, uh, was he very prolific in terms of um, designing buildings and even urban plans, some of which have been implemented, uh, not only in Egypt, but also regionally. Uh, I even saw a project that was for Caracas in Venezuela, no idea, no information about it. So what do we do with that kind of material? Um, projects in Algeria and so on, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, Jordan. Uh, so quite prolific, um, but also published the first, um, what, 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 what at least I can identify now as the first known Arabic language magazine is uh, focused on contemporary architectural practice at the time. So very important figure. Um, I'm just gonna go through a couple more of these. Uh, well, this is all of them. Um, oh yeah, so maybe I should say something about proposed projects. So it was really important for me when trying to piece together, um, I'm not so concerned with a narrative, which is perhaps why the book is not uh, a typical kind of text. Um, I can get back to that. I was much more interested in making it accessible as much as possible of the buildings that we know something about in terms of who, when, where, um, to be able to allow a, a, a wider audience to be able to sort of piece their own picture together. Uh, and this is why it's kind of a, a building-driven, geographically-driven, organized book um, in, that, in that way. Hence, the guidebook format was very useful. But in doing this, it was very clear to me that not only is this particular context of Cairo unusual because of the wealth of building practices, the diversity, but also how quickly a lot of it disappeared because of, well, we can talk about the reasons, very lax heritage uh, uh, rules, a very um, conflicted narrative about around who owns modernism. Um, are these forms foreign? Are they, um, you know, local? There isn't a genuine discussion within Egyptian universities because there are no art or architectural history departments within architectural history departments uh, within architecture schools in Egypt. They learn the same textbook that you learn in New Jersey, which is pretty ridiculous. And so they actually have no awareness as students in particular specimens, which means that the history of architecture that's right below beneath their feet is completely invisible. And so you can imagine what that has, what implications that has not only on, well, the formation of students of architecture and subsequent generations, the conceptions of what heritage is, um, so much is impacted by this uh, slip. Um, so this is why it was important to also include um, not only extend projects and demolished ones, but proposed ones, because it was very clear that a lot was proposed a lot was proposed that was never materialized and that this comes from a very particular, again, political context, why this is the case. But it seemed necessary that whenever possible, whenever relevant, to include proposed projects as people are constantly looking for, uh, well, what could have been if, you know, if we, we can criticize, um, I say, I suppose, a particular urban situation. Uh, but then there's always, there always comes the, so what next? And so I think the what next has been said before many times with these proposals that were never uh, circulated enough and therefore not part of the, the this artificial discourse. So it was important to include those as well. Um, yeah, and then I'll go quickly through the words uh, just to kind of recap for those who visited and to give a summary for those who haven't. So you learn about geographic areas, you learn about, again, uh, these kind of thematics, useful thematics maybe to position um, a lot of this architecture. Uh, throughout, I use QR codes um, to link to Google Maps in the, in the case of geographic areas, but also additional online resources like film trailers, documentaries, uh, and so on, which may be useful. Um, and you can see that this is a primarily graphic exhibition, and I can talk about, about that uh, a bit more, but maybe important to point out these two boards in the very end. Uh, one that has to do with heritage and the other one that has to do with research. Um, 
I don't know if I should talk too much about this now, but um, it was really it, one of the things that are really important for me with doing this work. Um, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to get to exhibit this at the Center for Architecture in New York um, is to actually not conceal the, um, the unevenness of the research terrain that we confront. Um, you know, some people can go to, uh, Columbia uh, Avery Library, um, you know, and, and make a request. And then when they go, they can find 20 or 30 or 50, or whatever, actually folders with drawings and details and exchanges. It's, um, you know, uh, I mean, it is cool for some people who do some kinds of research, but this is not the reality of doing architectural research around the world. Um, and so that was something that was important for me to bring to the forefront and not to conceal. Um, we were talking about disasters. We're talking about complete disasters. <laughs> we're, we're, we're entire, we're very uh, vibrant professional associations, uh, not to mention careers, uh, were completely destroyed in the last um, several decades, what we're calling our contemporary um, modern so-called global world or economy or culture that we are supposedly all inhabiting in that process, quite a lot of destruction has been happening that actually impedes architectural research, uh, whether directly or indirectly or why not, that's not besides the point. We know what happened. Studios were, architectural studios were confiscated, archives were scattered, photography studios were closed, we don't know where the photography went, um, uh, and so on. Uh, students of architecture, uh, you know, are harassed, um, your photography outside touristic areas uh, is frowned upon, um, hacking research, documentation of architecture, uh, especially when there's so much foundational work that hasn't been done already that we can build on. How can you do all that in a situation in which simply taking a picture of an old villa can end you in a police station? And that's in fact what happened with many of um, well, the, the members of the team that worked on the book and myself. Uh, so yeah, so it was important to, to bring that up. And um, I love this photo. It was taken by um, a pharmacist, uh, which is actually fantastic <laughs> because I want to remind people that architecture is not something that only architects and art historians should be concerned with. And more, more than anything else, architecture is literally the stuff that shapes our everyday lives. And um, one of the things that make me very optimistic in Egypt is how the audience of architecture is not just architects. In fact, most of the people who are very interested in architecture and social media and architecture heritage um, are well like like this man uh, pharmacist um, people who are not um, well it's well, well they're not the people that we are used to in other contexts to be the ones who are interested in architecture anyways um, I include the photo in the exhibition um, because I think it raises a very straightforward question which is what are the political whatever realities um, that have created these two vastly different architectures within in the same location within the span of less than a century. So it, it's kind of a nice uh, moment where you see the present and you see this particular past ver or slice of the past that uh, we're interested in, uh, modern architecture, um, and to, to sort of just raise the question right there. So what happened <laughs> between this and that, which honestly for me goes back to the very first question um, that came to mind when I was a student, and I was still trying to figure out what I will study. Uh, it was a very glaring contrast between the present and this particular um, set slice of the past. And so that's where that is. The Al Amara wall, as you see it, magazine culture is extremely important. Uh, in the exhibition, I include links to download the entire run of Al Amara, which is digitized by Harvard Libraries, and Alam Al Bina, which is another magazine that ran from 81 to 99. Um, so these are really, uh, and maybe this is also important to mention why Cairo Observer exists, um, because I was aware of this legacy of previous um, architects who were in whatever means uh, made that made sense at the time, created magazines and other uh, activities around, well, essentially architectural culture. Um, I think uh, this is very much a bit inspiration for why uh, something like Cairo Observer was necessary. Just one last, uh, yeah, so the timeline comes with sort of basically two boards. Um, one is this sort of uh, a provisional history um, is to 
remind people that history is not linear and so on, that what I mentioned earlier, but also the five point, points toward uh, decolonizing the history of architecture, uh, which I'm honestly a little bit surprised that it's even provocative for anyone, just because it says things like that. Uh, we live in a world where basically that was designed around the, uh, you know, un- uh, challenge superiority of the white male. I mean, uh, I think that should be pretty standard um, understanding of what the history of the last 500 years has been, really. And so in any case, um, as a cheeky sort of um, nudge, whatever, add the five points toward uh, a new art that Shabbat Le Corbusier, which was published almost a century ago and has expired a very long time ago already, but God knows we all get taught this stuff, um, which is really incredible. Um, as not as a sort of a fragment of a thought at, at a certain place in time, but actually as something to be adhered to. It's it's quite really bizarre uh, when you see the ways in which things like Le Corbusier's five points of architecture are taught in the so-called global decolonized global south, which is hardly decolonized or whatever, but uh, that's another point for discussion. So in any case, the five points are not aesthetic. I don't think to the move away from the very colonial structures that shape not only our um, understanding of architecture today, but history, but also architecture practice. Um, you know, the, to, to decolonize is to um, change the structural system, not to, uh, you know, respond with representational elements, whether in architecture or by appointing a certain person of color in your department so that you feel that, that you're decolonizing architecture. That's not necessarily how it works. Um, so yeah, so to, to recognize that history is not linear, to recognize the impact of colonialism in its past and present forms on architectural production, but also on the fate of archives and heritage. Um, I really like this quote because it sums up a lot in, uh, in like four or five words, which is the only primitivism, primitivism is Eurocentrism. I mean, well, Eurocentrism is something that we are, that's completely inescapable. Um, and it clearly comes with a very particular mindset that has root in this uh, colonial exploitative uh, project, which is primarily economic, but has really fantastically used culture to sell itself. Uh, and I think we're all still participating in that process. So in any case, the only primitivism is Eurocentrism, is point three. Uh, and to decenter artificial knowledge production, I think it's completely frustrating uh, in 2021, given everything that's been going on, to see that uh, architectural departments and uh, institutions that are completely separate from reality in Ivy League schools clustered in very particular geographies that they think that this is going to be the place in, from which a global history of architecture will emerge. Um, not really sure what kind of, um, who's fooling who here, but uh, yeah, decentral architectural knowledge. It seems like an obvious one. And paired with that is to also decenter the production of um, uh, meaning and value. I think whether we're talking about Detroit or we're, we're talking about Cairo, if local communities are the ones that are deciding what's important to them uh, and what it means, as opposed to a historian flying in, parachuting in from across the world, probably because they can, because of a particular economic cultural uh, setting that makes that happen, to parachute any place and to uh, be the ones that assign meaning and value of what means what and what's important and what we can include in our global history <laughs> books that I think is completely missing the point. Um, so in any case, um, so that's that. Um, and yeah, I think this is a pretty good uh, recap of the exhibition. Um, Alex, let me know if I've missed something in terms of... Uh, covering the actual exhibit, some of the ideas behind it. But um, I really want to open up for this question because I think that'll be a much more productive uh, way of using our time moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that was fantastic, great to see the overview. Um, not all the students were able to come on the weekend, so good for them to get a overview and for also for those of us who are joining us from elsewhere. Um, I'm gonna invite a couple of students to come up and ask questions. If you are in the audience uh, on the webinar and have a question, just pop that into the Q&A box and we will ask that for you. So um, 
Yeah. Uh, thanks for the lecture. Thank you so much. It wasn't awesome. much of a lecture, but thank you. <laughs> it was really enlightening, but uh, I have a couple questions for you. Yeah, First, please. Yes, um, what kind of limitations did you uh, notice or like, like when you were doing your research on demolished buildings and on buildings that never came into fruition, did you run into any limitations with the research? So the question is about limitation and research and in particular uh, demolished buildings, how to, uh, right? Okay, so I think, I I yeah, that's it. Should I go on? Yes. Yeah. So I think um, the question of demolition is very interesting for me because uh, A, uh, it's very visible right now. Um, in fact, the, the list of buildings that uh, we had started with when I was putting together the book, um, already throughout the whole production process, buildings that were still extant while writing the book were being demolished. Um, that's a kind of a, that's a pretty, it's a pretty difficult thing to witness because to, in, to actually make um, some of those selections meant to, well, you had to choose a very small sample out of a much bigger uh, landscape of architectural production in order to say something about maybe what some of the trends that are going on within this landscape. Now, once that's already a process, but by the time you get to a list to already have buildings before your eyes being demolished while working on a book, it's pretty. It's a pretty alarming situation, and I say this because demolitions are, have been, uh, and are, extremely active in places uh, such as Egypt. Uh, generally, places that um, I think the question of preservation act manifests in very different ways in different national contexts. Uh, but it is related to the question of demolition because ultimately it's a question about choosing what do we keep and what do we not keep. So if you don't have a clear democratic process of how that goes about, then somebody else is making a decision as to what a society should not keep. Now, if this is happening fast enough and in large quantities, and at the same time, it's not paired with institutions that are concerned with documentation of these buildings, then you're in a really catastrophic situation. I'm, try I'm trying to walk, through, walk us through the implications of what we talked about when we talked about demolitions. Um, it's easy, you know, when I came back to New York to uh, install the, the exhibit, it was, I had a very interesting reaction. I lived in New York for some time years ago, maybe a decade ago now. Uh, but, but and I've visited many times since, but somehow um, having my mind completely wrapped around the context like Cairo where demolitions uh, are very present to come back to New York City where, you know, there's a lot of development. It seemed strangely stable. Um, I don't know if I can describe this. I can't experience that kind of stability in Cairo where buildings are disappearing all the time. And remember the once they disappear, that's it, right? Um, what, whatever is going to replace them is often for uh, real estate speculation. So it's driven by a certain kind of economy. Um, and that driven and that economy is, back, is on the back of a certain kind of dictatorship uh, system that is uh, allowing uh, or needs corruption in order to actually survive, which is actually what colonial corruption does. This is how it manifests on the local level. Uh, you know, colonialism as a system, you know, uh, you know, if you're, it, it, it operates on corruption as one of its foundational mechanisms. And so it's really fascinating to watch how that then translates into a dictatorship on the local level. I don't separate uh, these uh, invasive political systems, whether it's colonial or a dictatorship that's backed by former colonial powers, you know. And so, where, so demolition and the lack of information and archives are all part of that kind of landscape for me. It's all about erasure. It's about a kind of a presumption that there's nothing important here. This is essentially what any colonial power does to a place. Um, so that operates until now under the current political structure. People are free to think what they think of that political structure, but it's very challenging because you're talking about a landscape in which it's normal for cities to demolish and rebuild things. 
right? There's a kind of a, nobody's saying that you cannot demolish anything, but it's very, very different when the demolitions target a very particular slice of, uh, of history and they make it completely invisible, both in the physical world, but also in terms of the archive and documents. So we have, so this is very challenging. And this was why it's really important to include uh, uh, no longer existing buildings in an architectural guide. I want people to actually go to the site and see what was there. <laughs> it's a big group of people. <laughs> yeah. if, if, okay. I hope, you, I hope can something comes up. Okay. Because Ava's going to come up. Yeah, thank you. I was going to ask why focus on Egypt but not other places like uh, Turkey or India, like uh, the yeah. US. Yeah. yeah. So, so Egypt for me was uh, was a kind of a, an obvious go-to uh, for a couple of different reasons. I'm Egyptian, whatever that means. Um, I mean, I was born in Alexandria, Egypt. Let me put it that way. Um, and and that was an important place for me to actually. Um, well, to shape my conception of what the built environment can look like uh, as someone born in the late 20th century, you know, Alexandria was my reference point in addition to Kuwait City, which is a place where my parents uh, worked uh, and lived sometimes. So, um, so that was kind of the, the geographic pull, but I've also been an immigrant, um, you know, and I immigrated to, my family immigrated to the United States, lived there for, uh, you know, 15 years nonstop. I was based there. Um, first 10 years as an immigrant, uh, I was 15. I never returned to Egypt. So uh, I say this because why Egypt, um, not only did it have a lot of impact on my formative uh, years in terms of thinking about architecture and the built environment, but also I had been so uh, detached from it for such a long time at that point that it made sense that this is where I would like to go to explore to also see where I come from. And it happens then that the 2011 uprising happens as I'm writing about the relationship be between architecture, politics, and revolution in relation to the 1952 coup d'etat. So you can see how things kind of all come together uh, um, not necessarily planned. I mean, you know, obviously they didn't plan to be experiencing a revolution when uh, I am writing about a revolution in the same place uh, and the relationship to architecture of those things. But it was very clear that architecture played a key role, not only in the shaping of spaces and people's understanding of where the society but also the unmaking of architecture and the control of architecture and urban spaces that are shaped by architecture were literally the, the glue uh, or that the kind of the, the I mean, component, let's call it, in what was going on politically during the uprisings of 2011. So for multiple, and that, of course, grew my interest in what was going on uh, in that particular place. Also, I didn't, I, don't, I mean, I'm fascinated by people who feel very comfortable to to talk about other geographic uh, contexts that they don't have personal uh, connections with. I think that's actually fascinating. And I'm always uh, <laughs> trying to pay attention to how that happens and how it works. Um, but it, it can also, one can view it as, a, as, as, as being something that's possible because of a certain set of privileges, for example. I, as an Egyptian American doing this research in Egypt, it was a very bizarre, uh, because on the one hand you feel slightly privileged, uh, but then you are aware, or I was aware of the very real colonial present of Egypt today being part of American empire ultimately. Um, so, so Egypt just seemed like the obvious, a lot was going on also, like I said, while I was there um, to witness and on, on top of what I was pulling out of our, our archival materials and, and magazines. Um, I just think it's really key, but historically besides all of this, um, you know, Egypt is, 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 is a curious place. I'm not saying every place in a way, if we follow this model that I'm proposing in the five points toward decolonizing architecture or decentering architectural knowledge um, and to, to decenter the production of value and meaning, I think Egypt is, a, is kind of, um, it's fascinating because it was at the intersection of 
really key political shifts that are shaping our world until today. Socially, it had a very interesting melange of people, mix of people uh, who happen to be in this particular place. I try to highlight this with the biographies of architects. You have an Italian immigrant who then becomes the chief, the chief architect of the Alcoff administration, religious endowment administration as a Catholic in the 19, in 1927. I mean, uh, 1927, try, try today to have a Muslim or uh, a Hindu design something for, let's say, um, a, a church in New York City. It's going to be a controversy. I mean, this is not even, apparently not even an issue that in 1927 this happened. Um, we have, we have uh, one more question from yeah. a student. This is Asma. Um, you talked about this before, about how preservation is like different for different people and different cultures. And I want to expand on like your idea of preservation uh, for you and for Egypt, as opposed to how we think of it here in the West. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, it's a huge topic, and honestly, I feel like um, it deserves a lot of a lot more work. Our models have been, our models of preservation have been, I would say, shaped by um, ideas of preservation that didn't come from the places where those ideas are applied, and often because they don't fit other places, then they end up being discarded altogether, and then you end up having well, practically you no know, preservation at all. <laughs> so, and this depends on what um, segment of architectural history you were talking about or heritage you were talking about. So a couple of general things to say here. One is um, it's really important to think about pre, let's say you have to find a, a point. Let's say since I used 1900 in the book to start my survey, let's, let's go to pre 1900. Pre-1900, most Egyptians, uh, the way we've been able to at least identify, I mean, if, I'm, if, I'm, if it's okay for me to generalize, um, and not only Egyptian cities, but I think in a lot of places, uh, you would find a kind of accumulative growth and development. Um, and there's a certain kind of, um, the value is often attached to things um, uh, not in a symbolic way, you know what I mean? So real estate today, for example, you know, uh, when you see that, um, uh, watch one of those real estate videos of a penthouse in New York City or something, it's like the most expensive penthouse, it's completely symbolic, you know, that number, the value that's attached to that piece of real estate is not actually what it costs to build. It has nothing to do with the materials that are being used. That's not really what it's about, right? It's about kind of symbolic value that's created around real estate. That's not how things have been almost ever. Uh, in, in let's say a pre-1900 world uh, in, in Cairo, for example, um, that's not how value was determined. Um, things were worth what they were worth because of what they are. And there is, uh, what that means is when you rip down an old house, you reuse as much of, of the old house as possible. Uh, and we see fragments, architectural fragments from older buildings that make their way into newer buildings. And so there's that kind of cumulative um, development or growth of architecture. Uh, what's really nice is along with that, oftentimes people left also documents. They document, they knew that they are reusing the you know, the old portal to a hammam into a new house or whatever it may be. And then this gets noted and we know it. And, and so there is preservation also kind of intellectual preservation. The fact that buildings have memories and those memories are oftentimes written down and so on. So that's one approach. That means that a city can change, of course, but when it changes, it incorporates as much of um, what it already has into the new that it's creating. Uh, I would say from our vantage point today in 2021, that sounds like a pretty good idea. <laughs> I think what we've abandoned, uh, sort of where architecture has drawn and its relationship to real estate and, uh, and its relationship to the, well, this sham of an economy <laughs> that we're all supposed to embrace um, is clearly not how things have been uh, in most places around the world. So. That's one general point I want to make out, that there is a local um, approach notion of preservation that is built into the fabric of a place. Now, things don't have to continue in that particular way, but what has happened in the 20th century in a place like Egypt, to be specific, 
are multiple political and economic shifts that very few cities I can think of can survive them. Imagine if New York City or Newark, let alone you know New York, you know whatever, any any of those well uh, North American cities um, going through two back-to-back political economic shifts, such as the ones that Cairo uh, experienced in the 60s and 70s. Uh, imagine if the government decides to uh, take all assets of uh, uh, wealthy individuals who may or may not have actually had um, posed a threat to a new political order. Uh, so you may want to control them by actually sequestering their assets, their buildings, and nationalizing them uh, as a gesture to the masses, the poorer masses, that you are uh, doing something good for the, for the general good of society. And then within a decade, uh, politics change and shift again, and um, the open door policy, which is a, an American driven policy, Harry uh, Kissinger um, type ideas, um, was implemented in the 1970s forward, which meant that the government should sell all of its assets. So suddenly, all of this private um, all these private assets, all these buildings um, that were commissioned by individuals, families, businesses, uh, mostly the Egyptian architects from this particular era, from the beginning of the 20th century up until the 1950s, most, m- most of it was uh, sequestered by the state and then within a decade or two uh, liquidated and sold. Imagine any city in North America surviving something like this. It's pretty rough. Uh, the impact of this on preservation is also pretty radical because it means that uh, there's a kind of a shift of who owns uh, wealth and power and they don't want to link themselves to the previous owners of wealth and power who now they own their, you know, whose assets now they own. So it's very natural for uh, a new elite to demolish uh, in this particular situation where it's very politically contentious, maybe in other places that wouldn't be the result, but in this one, it turned into the new elites demolishing most of what was uh, inherited, quote unquote, um, to them through these uh, problematic political economic policies back to back. And so they demolished them. Um, a, um, not out of evil or anything like this, but because mostly, you know, if you're buying a property um, in a particular economy where if you demolish the property, but you can build in its place a building where you can make a lot of money, of course, there's going to be an incentive. So everything is designed, was designed in a way to incentivize uh, the demolition of a certain kind of uh, architectural uh product uh, in order to make room for um, speculative real estate that would benefit a new elite. Where do preservation policies come into play in something like this? At those very same years, the state was, as in many other post-colonial countries, was looking or framing uh, pre-colonial constructions, whatever that may be, whenever you want to mark that, uh, as more authentic um, and that the, those should be the ones that should be preserved. That's not even the case. Just uh, a couple of years ago, um, right before the pandemic, I believe, a thousand year old uh, Wikela, uh, which is a kind of a a commercial uh, building um, in a very prominent location was demolished. Um, There are demolitions, um, you know, the, the positing of preservation is something that should be kept for only pre-colonial buildings because those are the pure, not yet contaminated by Western influence. Um, Even that doesn't apply, Uh, but it becomes a kind of a facade for a regime that actually doesn't care about history in general. (laughs) I mean, all of this stuff is being really uh, demolished left and right, whether it's modern or pre-modern, whatever, however we define these terms, I find these terms to be very problematic anyway. And they actually facilitate uh, uh, this kind of demolition machine to keep going. Since we don't have clear categories and terms to describe things, it makes it much easier for them to be targets for erasure. Um, so the that's one that's another point to make. I just want to also contextualize here, and if I'm going on too long on the issue of preservation, let me know. Is that in after World War II, what happened in Europe is a preservationist impulse to basically uh, protect everything that was left and rebuild um, so much of uh, what was destroyed uh, as if uh, the war never happened and a lot of American money went into this. Um, So a very particular notion of preservation was formulated. That came out of that 
political context and economic context. I think I feel like the idea that people want to copy paste models of preservation in other contexts, not uh, where that that just wouldn't make sense, is is not helping anyone. Um, so I, I I can say a few more things, but I'd love to engage with someone to like keep the conversation going, so that I'm not just sort of talking to myself. <laughs> Um, okay, so thank you so much. Um, does, does anyone have any questions? Any questions? So I'm just I'm just wary of our time here. I I have lots of questions for you, but I think I'm going to email them to you afterwards. But I would really love if you could talk um, to our students just a little bit about your time as a student at NJIT and how that um, led you to this career and how that has influenced your life, like. What, why is New Jersey or why is New Jersey important or not <laughs> to, your, to your personal growth as a, as a scholar? We'd love to hear a little bit about that. Um, well, uh, thank you, Alex. I mean, I think uh, one of the things that I have become very comfortable with in the last couple of years, um, maybe that wasn't the case before 2020, uh, to this de degree at least, is to be much more at peace and comfortable with um, with incorporating our personal stories into the work that we produce, because I think too much of what I read and learned uh, made so much more sense years later when I learned more about who wrote it or who said it. Um, and I think we tend to, to, to sort of minimize that a bit. And I think that's not really fair to ourselves, especially when we <laughs> have these kind of uh, life stories that shape uh, well, that have to do with colonialism, with immigration, with exploitation, with displacement of people, with erasure of their heritage, uh, the personal and the political. And I kept saying this over and over, almost in every conversation or interview I've had about this uh, project, is how the personal and political are really uh, intri intri intricately linked. And it's always been the case. I mean, can you really talk about Le Corbusier without talking about his personal and political connections? Um, you really wouldn't be able to understand. This is the inherited narrative that we have is one that takes that away uh, from the story. So we kind of create, um, yeah, these kind of figures who are, whether we're reading them or reading about them, uh, yeah, we don't know too much about where they come from. So anyways, in New Jersey for me is a place of immigration. Um, it is also a place of learning about things from a vantage point that I wasn't cultured into, uh, a vantage point that looks, uh, that has an us and them uh, built quite strongly, this is the US. Uh, um, a situation in which um, the very mechanisms that produce immigrants uh, also, uh, yeah, from the other side, uh, produce certain narratives about immigrants, which is ultimately very useful to place them within a certain kind of workforce. Uh, I say all of this because actually architectural education for me in New Jersey was fascinating for a couple of different things. Um, by the third year, I knew I wasn't going to be continuing to practice as an architect um, from my observations of what I was seeing uh, was going on around me, uh, especially students who already were starting to, um, to apprentice in offices, you know, drawing doorknobs, hallways and toilets for uh, free for New York based offices who are barely making money anyway, <laughs> you know, it just seemed like, what is all this about? Why are, if, you know, why are there hundreds of students graduating from these programs every year of the marketplace, you know, blah, blah, blah. These kinds of thoughts uh, were very clear. And this is what took me to, to, to stay in, um, um, in a university environment primarily. And I'm very honest about this uh, as a safety precaution to protect myself from this very strange society that I just got plugged into. Uh, so, so for me, the university, this is why it's really funny to me when I present the work of modernist architects, for example. Uh, one of the first questions I always get, and I just brought in an interview, and I'm like, my God, like, I'm not trying to shame people for ignorance, but at this point, if you're a New York-based writer, journalist, whatever, and you're not able to be up to date on what's going on, then you know you're, you don't really have an excuse. Um, and what's going on is that we know from scholarship in the last 20 years that certain narratives and histories are just 
were BS. And one of the main questions that really come up uh, about this question of education is, where were these architects educated? Um, and this is why I brought up the anecdote about Sayyid Karim arriving in Zurich the same year that Hitler comes to power. So this cannot in any way be a good situation for an Egyptian international student. Uh, this is happening in the 30s, but I'm also thinking about us now as international students or immigrants or children of immigrants going to schools in places like Rutgers or, or NGIT. Um, uh, the school of where the, this, the question of where you were educated is in no way a key to explaining what the person is and what they know. I mean, my education in the US cannot in any way be used as a key to explain my thinking. Uh, just like uh, Sayyid Karim's education in Zurich for a few years is not, it's not like he was um, indoctrinated into some sort of uh, embrace of the modern. So simply by entering the doors of a school in a European context, you come out a modernist the other end. That's completely ridiculous. Um, and so uh, question narrative identity present uh, student and it's because of the absence of narratives that have to do with architecture that got me interested in architecture in the first place. Not only were they absent from our education, that they still are, but also there is a kind of a general narrative that is uh, such as what William says, uh, uh, William, uh, uh, William Curtis, this is why I put that particular quote on the wall, because, you know, there's a put down narrative around the things that are not included. So not only uh, is, are we talking about the universalization of very provincial narratives, we're also talking about uh, essentially white liberal dudes, it's always men, at least most of the time, who, um, you know, not only are they provincial in what they present, but they have a put down narrative about, about everything else. And that was very frustrating for me as a student. Uh, what is this person talking about? Uh, but the funny thing is, you say that as a 20 something um, young student or 20 year old student, what is this person talking about? And then here I am 40 uh, years old saying practically the same thing, but now I can say it to a group of students, right? So it's kind of just fascinating how uh, watching all of, just watching how my educational experience in an American context as an immigrant, the, the narratives around architecture, which you can take that and extrapolate it into narratives within art history, which is probably one of the most problematic fields uh, I've been exposed to um, uh, and so on. And yeah, it's a lot of exclusion. And so I guess the short answer, I just give a long answer, but the short answer is my experience in New Jersey was very formative in shaping uh, what I need to, um, to respond to, unfortunately. And I think it's not, I just want to point out that it does not feel very nice to end up spending a career responding because others are just saying things. Is right, so privilege plays out in, in really fascinating ways, just even in what we have to say, uh, in terms of uh, as scholars or as individuals or as students or so on within the university context. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that, but um, I, I would say, I would say, just before leaving it, is that it's really in the context of everything that's going on in the world, if this is not a time to rethink. All of these categories that we've all been imprisoned by, all of these ridiculous narratives that whether they're coming from liberal voices or not have white supremacy at their bases or whatever they may be. If this is not a time to up, up, upend all of this and challenge India, then we may be missing a really good opportunity. Maybe a big opportunity, but it may be the only one. So one of those I love to challenge, and I said this when I came to uh, um, to give a lecture last uh, in March 2020 pandemic at NGIT, I said my own uh, school, I said, we need to rethink the model because I came out of this context and I know that there's way too many students prepared for things that they will never actually be able to use uh, professionally down the line. So you may end up a historian or, you know, a freelance critic, or you may end up doing whatever other uh, but not everyone is going to graduate from these programs being Zahadids and Reb Kulhases. And I think it's just like pretty obvious, but it's time to really snap this. Because a lot of the students are international. A lot of them are immigrants. A lot of them come from humble backgrounds, uh, and particularly in schools like where I went in NGIT. And to be able to look 
at a group of students like this, then graduating to not even be able to help themselves or their families because of the economy that we all have to live in is pretty ridiculous. Um, I was in school mostly to protect myself uh, from this new society that I was plugged into, but I wouldn't say that that was formative in thinking about what I want to write about. Let me just put it that way. Okay, well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Thank you so much, Alex, um, and thank you all. And I'm happy to answer any questions by email if Alex, um, if, you're, if you'd like to collect questions and, yeah. and send them to me, I'll be happy to answer them as well. Okay, so, okay. thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Take care.